Hello, my name is Tom Agueta, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Technion. And I will talk to you today about occurrence data cleaning in R, how to automate this process. A bit about myself. My research is dealing with developing tools and methodology for data-intensive biodiversity research. I'm working on all three aspects because each one really fits the other two. In this talk, I'm going to give a short introduction about data cleaning and about data cleaning in R. Then I will talk about understanding how to automate things. So you really have to understand reproducibility. I will try to break it down to its components, and then I will try to give you as much practical information as I can. Then I will talk about data cleaning in R, what is out there. Then I'm very excited to present you the Bitiverse, which is a very cool set of tools my team and I are working on. Then I will highlight more general resources that I think worth your attention and finish with a few tips and advice. Please notice the beginner, intermediate, and advanced labels next to the navigation bar. These are labels that notify the R skill set level. I try to characterize and classify each of the resources accordingly. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so data cleaning. Why it's so hard? Well, at the user level, it's all about data fitness for use. It can really only happen if you know your data, meaning you know and understand its structure and its source. It's also required that you know pretty well your research taxon and your obviously analysis and its assumptions. And on top of that, it really helpful if you can able to master all the methods and tools for data cleaning. So that's a lot. So no surprise that most users don't invest enough in data cleaning. And this fundamental challenge of data quality assessment to some degree is really invalidate the usage of this data in research. And if we examine our analysis pipeline, we can see that data cleaning is at the beginning of our workflow. So unsuitable data in, poor result out. Keep in mind that quality data beats fancy algorithm, basically any day, any time, no shade. If you want to have a more comprehensive view on this matter, I urge you to read this very recently published paper summarizing the development of biodiversity data quality infrastructure, building the necessary standards. This is a mind-boggling task that being carried out by the Tedwig Data Quality Task Group. So on top of this, dealing with data cleaning in, in R is also particularly challenging because R is a programming language after all. It has a steep and multi-level learning curve. And dealing with data without any GUI is even harder. And it takes getting used to. So we can confidently say that being a biodiversity data scientist is hard. You need to master your programming skills. You need to understand data quality, you need to understand reproducibility, and you basically need to be a super scientist. So technical and analytical skills are increasingly required for biodiversity research. And we need to ask ourselves, what can we do about it? So I'm saying that the key to handling it is reproducibility. So what is reproducibility? The formal definition is the ability to reproduce results by a peer. But it's not just by your peers. It's also by yourself. And by your future self is even better. 
and by your future future self, which is either a time loop thing or a very, very long forgotten analysis. Also, ability is kind of a spectrum, and this is exactly what Roger Peng is saying in his paper in, from 2011. That having just a publication or just a publication in the code or just a publication in the code and the data is not enough. You have to have the proper linkage to achieve reproducibility. And why you should do it? Well, there are many reasons for that, mostly because it in the end it will save you time, it facilitates collaboration, it reduces the risk of error, and it generates much more authoritative research. But why reproducibility is so hard? Well, because the entire research cycle is a complex process and reproducibility is a demanding guide. The better your programming skills are, the more options you basically have. And this takes time, practice. Good project management skills are also required. And that takes experience. Long-term planning, usually a factor of trauma. But above all, maybe this is the good news, it's a mindset. Reproducibility operates on all levels, starting with the analysis level, then moving up to the project level, then up to the entire environment where in our project inhabit. And then we'll see how we can distribute the entire thing. So let's get inside into each level and the usage of R will be our focal point. How can we make our analysis more reproducible? First, we need to invest in the coding style. Learning one will be a good investment. It will provide us with consistency and clarity when reading our code and writing it. It will help us making the code much easier since you have less decision to make. And also, if you get confused with indention and, and parentheses placing, use Tyler it will help you tremendously. If you're starting with R and just a beginner, then know that this is exactly the time to start learning the style of code and invest in it because good habits are easier at the beginning. Also, invest in learning R Markdown, which is a human-friendly code, and much more. I'm quoting R Markdown website saying that your data tells a story, tell it with R Markdown, turn your analysis into high-quality documentation, reports, and presentation, and dashboard. Actually, it's all true. And it's best news is actually very fairly easy to pick up. So don't hesitate. Learn R Markdown. Invest in your general data cleaning skills in R, as it's one of the most important skills any data scientist should have. Once in a while, Google data cleaning in R or check Tidy Tuesday, which is a weekly social data project in R that you can learn a lot from how to tidy your data. Use YouTube to learn from tricks from experienced data scientists. Do some search and let YouTube algorithm do the job for you. R is a functional based language, meaning it's designed for creating functions. And functions can be your friend. Be open minded to an idea. You might be surprised how much fun it really is. Try to identify a really painful and repetitive task and start there. It's much easier than you think. And finally, embrace parallel computing. It will make your code run much faster. And this subject, although has many layers and complexity, but you can have really cool tricks up your sleeve very fast. Also check our studio jobs, which can help you a lot in your daily work in our studio. What is an R project? It's a self-contained portable project. It's very easy to set up. The working directory is set to the root of the project right at launch. It uses a fresh session every time the project is launched. 
And I really recommend you to read Jane Bryant's post on project-oriented workflows. It's a very important, big no nos and exactly why. And if you want to open a new project in our studio, you just go to File, New Project, and choose the directory you want to put the project in, and voila. Properly structuring your R project is the start of any good project. Having a fixed and useful structure will allow you to focus on your code. I encourage you to read this guide created by the British Ecological Society. Also, you can get an in-depth understanding on how to name your files and how to practice safe path and much more. Embracing version control is a life-changing experience, but it's harder to understand if you work along a project. The best and fastest way to get Git and GitHub is by having a collaborative code-based project. Perhaps you can have a fun lab project with all the lab members. Also, everything you need to know about Git and GitHub can be found in this great manual created by Jenny Bryan and Jim Hester. If you want to take your project with put disability to the next level, check Drake. It's an impressive R-focused pipeline toolkit for reproducibility and high-performance computing with superb, superb documentation. Moving up to the environment, we basically need a way to control it as much as possible. There are three main strategies. One is to make it static. The second one is using a dependency management package. And the third option, which is the more complex, is to encapsulate the entire environment. I will talk on each separately. So how to make your R packages static? It's fairly easy to do. The first thing it's recommended to have is a designated R script for installing packages. The reason is that you need to set up a specific R option, which is a repos option. And if you set it up for a crane snapshot for a specific time uh, that crane, the archive of packages, can then R uses this trait for its packages and always will download the same version of our package. I will show you an example very soon. Then after you set up this option, all you need to do is install your packages using the install package function. And the only caveat is that you need to remember that before you install any new packages, you have to set this option, just run it before any new installation of package is being done in your project. All you need to do is to have in your R installation script one line of code. And in this line, you just need to set up the date of the URL of the snapshot based on this format. And this will ensure that all the packages downloaded are downloaded from the same date, meaning that they will have the same package version. And this will give you stability when you run your analysis. And if you need a specific version, you can change the date accordingly and install only just that package. Also, know that here is the package checkpoint created by Microsoft that does the exact same thing, just with less typing. So, good luck. A second option is to use a dependency management package, specifically called RENV, R for reproducible and N for environment which is exactly what we need. It used to be called Packrat, but this is the new and improved package. It can be initialized during the project setup. Just click this uh, checkbox. Or it can be done in an existing project by going to the tools, then choosing the project option, and then in the environment, check this box. And this package is fairly easy to, to understand and, and, and control. And I re highly recommend you to view uh, Kevin O'Shea, which is the creator of this package, recent uh, RStudio conf talk. And the documentation is really uh, simple to understand. So we just one click away. The third option is a bit more demanding. It requires the download and installation of Docker 
which is able to control the entire environment. It's basically a computer inside a computer that is able to encapsulate a specific Linux type operating system, a specific R version, a specific R Studio version, specific library, Linux libraries that can be installed, and specific R packages, all in one container that is easily deployable. And this image is very smartly built, and you can combine and share many different images, and you have a lot of options. There are a lot of good manuals to use Docker with R. This one was created by the R OpenSci community. So if you open to the idea, this manual will go through each step and lead you the way. Also, there are many different containers designed for the R environment, created and maintained by the Broker project. Finally, we need to deal with the distribution of the entire project or analysis. One way of doing it is by creating a package from your entire analysis that support the installation of the different dependencies packages and set a specific version for them. This is a more frightening task than it actually is. So we just need to be courageous. A second option is to combine the packaging, but with Docker, and to create an entire compendia, research compendia, which is a really, really standardized and, and stable way of making sure your analysis is forever be able to deploy it. The third option is to use Binder that combines Docker with Jupyter Hub and can give you in seconds an environment to run your analysis anytime you need to show it to someone. All the options are great and have great documentation. They might look scary, but once you dig in, you will see that it's not that terrible. And if I need to choose only one resource that invoke you in this reproducibility journey, I will have to choose this one. It's a workshop created by Dr. Anna Cristale and Dr. Tom Webb about R for reproducible research. And it's really a series of great presentations that will give you the necessary appetite to do it. I use that a lot for building this presentation. So thank you, Tom and Anna. And I guess that the take home message from this chapter is that, that if you love yourself, you should invest in your programming skills. But if you truly love yourself, you will invest in your reproducibility skills too. So, have a successful reproducible journey. Okay, so let's talk a bit about data cleaning in R. During this course, you had a great presentation in week five from Sarah and Andrea about biodiversity tools for data cleaning. They describe in great detail the different packages that you can use, and there is a great exercise. Also, Town is explaining you in this week presentation, giving you a more understanding of how data cleaning should be done. And obviously, John, in his presentation from last week, gave you a lot of, a lot of information about how data cores, data, data core is built. If you are new to data cleaning in R, do the exercise from week five. It will give you a really good basis of how to deal with some aspect of data cleaning. Also, I recommend you to go through the series of manuals from the Coordinate Cleaner package. Alexander Ziska and his team did a really impressive job in this package. And finally, I recommend you to go through the documentation of Scrub R. It's a fundamental data cleaning package created by Scott Chamberlain from R OpenSci. He created tons of packages. Data cleaning is a hard and long battle. And we need to ask ourselves, how can we fight a good fight? One, one way of doing it is by constantly asking ourselves what data users needs, what they actually have, and how can we mitigate this gap? 
And since we're dealing with the R ecosystem, it's an amazing place to work because we have so much things that we can use. It's like a synergy party of packages and welcoming community. And the analysis of most of our users is being done in R. So it makes a lot of sense to do it in R. But are users able to really synthesize everything that's going on? And the answer is probably not because this kind of synthesis requires a lot of supporting developer and most users really can handle it. But can we develop something that strategically is trying to connect all this our amazingness? So for that purpose, me and my team are developing the Bdiverse, which is a family of R packages for biodiversity data. And it's a very cool concept of connectivity between packages in a way that each one is, it, is a world of its own, but it's highly connected to the other packages. And we wanted to develop a coherent and a user-friendly environment for biodiversity data quality assessment. And this didn't start with seven packages, there are even more. It started from identifying the main problems and for each distinct problem, trying to develop a package or two packages to support it. So our first challenge was data standardization. Although Darwin Core is the adopted standard, different aggregators have different variation in their field name. And when you are inputting this data into R, so even a small modification with the name can be crucial for understanding what exactly this field and what we can do with it. And we wanted the BDVS to be as inclusive as possible. So it can support all of the data, biodiversity data from all aggregators, as long as it's Darwin Core. So for that purpose, we developed the BD Darwin Core package. The BD Darwin Core is basically a system to Darwinize your data. It uses the Darwin Cloud, which is a huge lookup table that takes different variations and adjusts them to the standardized field name. And it's basically our default dictionary. You can also create and input your own dictionary for different reasons. And once the data is attached with a specific dictionary, it's been standardized. We also have a Shiny app that allows us to carefully do it manually and create your own dictionary if you want, and to check everything is on order, in order. And we use this app actually to supply and give more information about Darwin Core. So it's a good opportunity by clicking on a, on a specific name field to get the actual explanation from the Darwin Core reference manual. We are building a monitoring system just to make sure that if there is some kind of unexpected change from a specific provider that we will be aware of it, then we can adjust the dictionary and the Darwin Cloud. So the BD Darwin Core app looks like this you download or upload a data to it. And then you upload a dictionary, either using a Darwin Cloud or downloading it, downloading it or uploading your own dictionary. Then you get into the Darwinization model that helps you Darwinize and do some manual Darwinization if you need. And you can even click on a specific name of the field and get the reference guide of it. And then you can download your data, different options, and carry on with your process. Our second main challenge is dealing with data quality checks. These checks are the base of data quality assessment. 
and we need the mechanism that will help user to conveniently choose them, to prefer them, to filter their result. Also, we need the mechanism that able to support so many data checks because we want to have a lot of them. So we need the mechanism that is easy to create new checks, to test them, to maintain them and manage them. So for this purpose, we created PD checks. And PD checks is a very cool way of, of re-envisioning checks in R, where we created a metadata file that stores all the metadata of all of the checks. We have a R functionality file that stores the actual R function for a specific data check. And we have a table for each check that tested different scenarios of these checks. And we develop a mechanism that help us to combine everything and weave everything together into a, a package. Meaning that you have a BD check object that is, has a lot of it's all its metadata, it has its R functionality, and it uses all of this testing scenario into a testing framework to make sure that these tests are working properly. So we had developed a Shiny app for that, and I show you very soon. We also have the BD Checks admin app, which helps us to design and create the checks and test them and make sure that they are compliant with the general standard designed by Tedwick Task Force that I mentioned in my introduction. So we want to connect what is going on with R with what is going on with the general standards that are being developed. And in the app, again, we have the data upload download model. And once data is inserted, you can go to the data checks tab, choose which check you want. You can get a more detailed view of any of every check. You can filter them or, or organize them accordingly. And once you choose the checks you want to run, you perform the quality checks, and then you get a table that helps you filter the result that you want to filter out. And then you can download the data based on this filtration. We also have a citation model that is also a shared model. Here also we have a complete functionality support from R, so you can run it in your script, either to perform specific checks or all the checks, get a summarization table of the result of the checks. We also identified the third challenge that is all about user-friendly cleaning workflow. We wanted to develop something that will make people that aren't that familiar with data cleaning and are that feel comfortable using R, a safe environment to perform at least basic operations. So this is a shiny app that ask the user different type of questions and based on the result perform the cleaning and give a very detailed report. So we call this BD clean and BD clean is all about questionnaires and creating them quite fast. So it's just a shiny app because we don't expect any of the users to actually use the console. And once you answer the, the questionnaire, you get flagging of the data, and then you choose if you want to clean it, and then you get report. So this is how it looks. Again, you download the data. Here you can also darwinize it, also in the video checks. So you can darwinize it within the app. You get a questionnaire about different aspects, special taxonomic, temporal, and it behind the scene it operates, it operates BD checks. So this is a cool connectivity. And then you choose the type of cleaning that you want to do and what you want to do with missing values. And you get different types of the data 
with flags, without flags, only the clean data, only the bad data, and different kind of reports. Last but not least, we are working on developing Greedy Dashboard. We have a working prototype, a working demo actually, that you can see here. We are now working on making it production ready because we want it to be a general purpose biodiversity dashboard. So it needs to support different scenarios and different types of data. So we're trying to maximize the features to support this kind of variation. We have BDVs, which is the, should be, when it will be ready, the foundations of biodiversity data visualizations with supported functionality. And we also hope in the future to develop BD tools, which is a package that should be designed for any type of analysis inclu that includes biodiversity data. But we can use all of the different models and functionality that we developed in the Vidiverse to support the analysis. We have the Vidiverse deployed in Binder. So you can just use this link to get an RStudio environment where you can upload the library and upload the entire functionality of the Vidiverse. So you need to worry only about one package, basically. We have the Vidiverse website which stores all the relevant links and manuals and information you need. We also have a user guide to guide you how to install Bdiverse, how to use the app launcher, how to operate each of the apps and each of the packages, and what is the overall functionality that you, can, you need to know about. It also supplies you with some important information about data cleaning and the standards. In addition, we're working on developing a development guide, which helps us describe in great details what is going on under the hood, the architecture and the different frameworks that we are developing to support the believers. So this guide hopefully will help other people help us, but it will also make sure that we are following our standard and having a full documentation of our processes. And when we are dealing with such a complex system that deals with data cleaning and quality assessment, it's really important to invest as much as we can about its own data quality, its own QA, its own uh, system of, of tests and checks and integrity, and to maintain the R packages and the shiny apps requires creativity. So we are working on all of that and we understand how important it is. And this is right now our main priority to make it production ready. We also know that reproducibility, as I just mentioned, is a key factor. And, and while the apps and the functions and the package are quite reproducible, we can always stretch it and, and experiment with different approaches like shiny, shiny meta and other stuff. So it's something we can always improve on. And this is something we need to work on. Another principle is education. And it means that we have an opportunity to know when a user is using our apps, what exactly he needs. So if we can supply him with just enough information, a digestible amount of information at exactly the moment, need, this can benefit him tremendously. And I'll finish with the last principle. It's saying that collaboration is a necessity. If we want to make sure that Vidiverse is sustainable and that all of the different groups are being represented uh, in this kind of environment, we really need to be open and accepting and, and able to support a uh, community. So hopefully, if we'll develop the right foundations, this will come also. And the Believers story is kind of a cool one because we were able to build our team, me, Vijay, and Yuhai, using the Google Summer of Code program. So using this program, we introduced Tilosh and Povelas and Raul to our team. And now each of them is a valuable member that has its own responsibility. 
So to read more about each of us, you're welcome to visit our website. I would like to thank the ISF, Google Summer of Code, and the Blumstein Family Fund for supporting this research. Before I conclude, I would like to highlight some general resources. First, our OpenSci. If you're using R, you probably use many of their packages. It's an amazing organization that really promotes open science, reproducibility, and peer review software. So if you have the chance and you're not familiar with the work, you will not regret it. Also, our studio. I don't know what I would have done without our studio or our open science. Really, my job would not be possible. They really promote R and the community and developing so many tools like Shiny and R. It's incredible. Also, the website is a data warehouse of resources, everything that you need. I would also like to mention OpenScape, which is a community for environmental scientists to engage in open data science. Our Markdown, that I mentioned several times before. It's an extremely versatile tool that you can do so much with it, and it's fairly easy to learn. There is also the R Studio Cloud, an extremely easy way to teach R and learn R without any installation. Just open an account and you get tons of projects to share with your peers or to work on your own. There is some limitation regarding the computation of power and the memory usage of a project, but you're getting all of this for free. So amazing. There is also the R for data science online learning community. They have a Slack channel that you can join and ask for help. And it's an entire community dealing with helping each other online. On the other hand, you have all the R user community groups that you can join one, at least if you're not in quarantine or in the future, hopefully. There is also the possibility of letting the resources come to you. So by registering to a notification in our bloggers or to our weekly or in our studio community website, or just in Twitter, just follow the main people and you'll get tons of resources at your way. To finish my talk, I would like to offer some tips. Each of us, is a creator of its own resources. So it makes sense to invest in a system that helps you find, store, tag, and retrieve relevant resources at the moment of need. It's really hard to Google vague memory of something. Also, have a useful staff R project. Store useful snippet of code, tricks, and coding ideas. You can do it in a very organized way and practice your project structure techniques. Try to learn the R terminology, like the name of different objects and the R operations. You will be able to Google your questions in a much more efficient and accurate way. This will help you find your answer much faster. Invest the time to really learn your IDE, meaning your R interface, probably R Studio. It's your coding home, and you will spend a lot of time in it. Investing in reproducibility will enhance your ability to deal with uncertainties related to data cleaning. You will be able to try different thresholds and examine the sensitivity of your results to different cleaning procedures while minimizing the damage to your mental health. So thank you for listening and thank you Town and the team for all your hard work. I must confess that I'm a bit jealous of your participant of this course, because I wish I had this kind of course when I start to learn about ecological niche modeling. But anyway, we are very lucky to have this resource to our disposal from now on. Don't forget to post questions in the QA file, and I hope all of you and your loved ones are safe. I just hope we will be able to get a bit wiser after this horrific pandemic 
I'm praying for a massive, massive version upgrade for humanity. Stay safe, Tomer.